Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Steve Wallach, my partner in crime, Vasily Giannarakos, back for another episode. Vasily, my friend, how are you? Doing well, Yareev. Happy to be back for another week, uh, especially with a ton of news uh, coming out of the Flyers camp over the weekend and the draft coming up uh, next week. So it's going to be a great time. I'm personally going to be able to head down there uh, in Nashville to cover the draft of uh, representing Flyers Diddy. So it's going to be awesome. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we have a great guest on this week as well. I will let you introduce him, Yareev, and we can get started and get uh, down to the nitty gritty of things. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Throwing in the site name right at the end. Uh, yeah, you alluded to it. So those who are not aware, Connor Doherty, he is a writer for Flyers Nitty Gritty. He has been covering, um, he has been, he actually went to the last draft coverage. Unfortunately, we only have access for one this time. Um, but Connor's on here. He's been writing for us for a while. So definitely make sure to check that out and look at the names. Connor, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate, really, uh, appreciate you guys having me. Excited to talk to Flyers. Yeah, man. And, uh, like I was saying off camera, this was kind of like partially a plan to do because all three of us were supposed to go to the draft. Not working out that way, but we decided to send Vasily as our representative. So he will be at the draft, which is going to be pretty awesome. Um, last year, we had two guys. And I think just this year with the amount of people who are going and I imagine the buzz around somebody like Connor Bedard, there's just going to be more media people there. So probably limiting a small site like us versus, you know. I mean, PSN, Sportsnet, and stuff like that. Yeah, let's be honest. We're not them. Uh, we're not hitting those numbers, so I get it. Um, but outside of that, we got a lot to talk about. First and foremost, I do want to give a shout-out to our sponsor, Jim Stakes. They are not open yet, but again, I will let you know, Jim Stakes on 4th and South, when they open, please make sure to go get them, go get a cheesesteak from them because they are the sponsor of the show. And that's why I'm asking. And don't also forget to please like, subscribe, um, share if you can, comment, download it if you really want, do whatever. But any interaction you do for us is a humongous help. It has helped grow our show considerably. We see the increased interaction, and uh, it is humbling. So thank you all so much for what you've done so far. Um, yeah, but more is helpful. So thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's get into it. We got a bunch of topics today. We're going to talk about some trade rumors. Um, if you're a Flyers fan, you're aware of these rumors because they're everywhere. Um, we'll talk about a re-signing um, on the AHL side. Uh, we'll talk about some defensive pairings. We talked a little bit about that last time. We'll talk about that again here, knowing now that maybe some bodies are going to be moving out ASAP. Um, and then we'll go into draft talk, and we'll keep it simple, and we'll we'll kind of go off the cuff. We're kind of in this weird period um, where we're kind of waiting on things to happen. The draft is happening on Wednesday. When you hear this, it'll be Tuesday when this drops. Um, so we're right approaching the draft. So a lot of it's kind of just noise. Um, let's get into it though. Trade rumors galore. We'll go into the big, the big bad one that, uh, has been coming out and the blues and the flyers have been somewhat imminent on a trade one centered around Kevin Hayes. Um, and I'll just break this down quickly. Uh, Kevin Hayes was the, the main player that is rumored to still be going there. I guess uh, this trade was supposed to be imminent, um, but Kevin Hayes, Travis Sanheim was thrown around. Scott Lawton was thrown around in the deal. I, I did hear some connecting, but I I don't buy that. I think mostly it was Sanheim, Lawton and Hayes. And then a rumored package going the other way of uh, probably one of the, one of the three firsts that St. Louis owns this year. One of the later ones. Um, and then Tory Krug, who axed, the trade um, vying to utilize his no trade clause. Um, Vasily, I'll open up to you first. What do you think about the, this trade rumor that was said to be imminent? And again, I, I bring this up all the time, like be weary of rumors. I don't love them, but what do you think about these rumors? Um, they at least are exciting. I, I don't deny that. Yeah. I think uh, for the rumors in general, Hayes being on the move uh, or being rumored to move, that doesn't really surprise me. And St. Louis doesn't really surprise me as a destination because I think uh, Frank Saravalli in his trade target board last week, we kind of went in depth on his article and he mentioned St. Louis as being a possibility. So obviously there's been rumblings of this happening. I think what really surprised me about it all is Sandheim being... Um, involved here too because i just even though you know the flyers are probably looking to try to move him potentially i just feel as though with provorov already being moved 
you know, if, if, if maybe they weren't getting what they expected, let's say a first rounder for Sanheim or something that they valued, um, they likely probably would maybe try to keep him, keep a veteran on that defense score. So I think that's what really surprises me most. Um, shout out to, um, you know, Anthony Sanfilippo, uh, Anthony DeMarco as well. They had some scoops um, over the weekend kind of surrounding this. Um, I believe uh, San Sanfilippo mentioned that up to floor uh, Flyers, NHL players are potentially involved in the discussion, uh, but then eventually just ended up being Sandheim and Hayes. So like, as you said, you're either, it might have been other players involved, but obviously shifted quickly from that to kind of more big money, older players that the Flyers seem to be looking to move. And I think just going in the direction that they're going with younger guys, kind of trending towards a rebuild, I think it, it all really makes sense that um, it's Hayes and Sandheim that the team's looking to, to move out. In terms of uh, what they're getting back, like the first rounder makes sense. I think that's more for Sandheim. Krug is probably the contract, obviously, that the Flyers have to eat to take back uh, because they're giving up so much salary. So it makes sense, right? He's at $6.5 million. Obviously, he waves uh, or doesn't uh, agree to waive the no-trade clause. But that's his right, ultimately, right? He, he earned that. So I see a lot of people kind of giving him shit online. And it's realistically the player. I would say that... Um, you know, the, the Blues, if they really want the deal to work out, it's on them, I think, as a team to kind of talk to the player and establish the fact that, okay, um, are you willing to move if, if we try to shop you or, or trade you? It doesn't seem like that was established before, before that point, so who knows? And also something to mention, too, um, I think Keith Jones mentioned this on WIP um, this morning or whenever he was on today that... Um, some of the things you heard over the weekend weren't necessarily true, right? So, so who exactly knows, right? We're not in the rooms. Sometimes, like you're saying, things get released uh, for certain agendas. But I, I do believe the Flyers are probably actively shopping Hayes and Sanheim at this point, just with all the media members kind of uh, reporting it and all the other teams potentially involved. I don't know if this deal ends up going through now. We'll kind of see. I, I tweeted over the weekend that usually uh, if a player with the trade kind of value or – that Krug has way, uh, doesn't you know want to waive his no trade. Typically, that'll kill a deal, right? So, at this point, the Flyers haven't found another team to potentially flip him to. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up pivoting. Uh, what What do you think about the deal or rumored deal there, Connor? Yeah, I, I thought it was definitely interesting. Uh, Kevin Hayes, seemingly from from exit day, uh, it looked like he expected to be moved. He said he would find out around the draft, and here we are four or five days before the draft day three of the trade uh, actually. And we're still different things are still coming out about this potential deal. Uh, it does seem like Hayes is still pretty much a, a lock to be going to St. Louis at this point. Um, whether or not Krug ends up coming back is, is one thing. Uh, but there's a lot that the Flyers could do with a first round pick that be, could be coming back. That's something that they could package to potentially move up and target Mijkov. Uh it's something they could use package 22 and whether it is 25 or, or 29 I think those are the two picks that the Blues have mm -hmm. uh, whether they want to package those two and move up uh, to somewhere around 10 to 15 if you know another forward drops that they like whether it's you know Crystal or more or anyone like that uh, they can move up and try to get someone like that with another team that has two picks I know Nashville has two I think uh, Detroit has two, and I think the Coyotes also have two. Um, I know Arizona had two in the first round last year and took two forwards. Uh, it seems like this year they're they're pretty much targeting uh, the Reinbacher. Um, so yeah, I think it it would definitely open up a lot of options. It would leave if Sanheim is in the deal. It would leave the Flyers with a pretty inexperienced blue line, uh, at least on the left side. I think Cam York just probably becomes a top pair guy uh, just kind of by default there because Provrov's gone. Uh, Sandheim would be gone as well, but yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. And then there's the, the Krug no movement clause kind of side that you have to deal with. And I, I think Vasily, you said that, you know, that that's probably one of the first things you want to talk about when you're discussing a trade is you want to approach the guy and say, Hey, we're thinking about moving you is this something that you would waive your no movement clause for if he says yes then you proceed with the deal if not then you try to work a way around it find another guy or try to find a third team uh which i think the boston moves were a little bit interesting today they're clearing cap i know there's been some a couple guys up there that 
want to see Krug back in uh, back in TD Garden up there. Um, but there's been rumors that that's for trying to re-sign Tyler Bertuzzi. So who knows what's really going to happen. Uh, definitely interesting, though. Um, so, yeah, I think on Wednesday night we should uh, – we should have a a bit better picture of what's really going to happen. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I want to point something out, and I didn't notice this said at, at all in this trade. And I know everybody's in love with the idea of getting a first-round pick, and I think we can do it. I, like, is And everybody's, like, really mad at Tory Krug for not waving his no-trade calls. I have this, like, sneaking suspicion he might have saved us from him. The guy's 32 years old. He's making eight and a half million, by the way, this year. Six cap wise, it's only six something, right? Six and a he, half, yeah. He he was a minus 26 last year on St. Louis, okay? He he had 32 points in 63 games, which is very good, right? Like he's obviously he still has an offensive upside. He, imagine putting an undersized defenseman who's getting older. On John Tortorella's team, who's making six point something million dollars a year for the next four years, I'm not shitting on Tory Krug as a player, but how is that a great idea? And I know that like the first round pick, and if it's being used for a big move, like I get that, but it's like that also seems like a problem. You know, it's almost like aren't we better off just keeping Kevin Hayes? You know, I I don't know. I and mean, why not just trade Sanheim for a first or whatever, or find a deal around that? You know. Or something. I don't know. I I just I I never I didn't love the idea of Tory Crew here for four more years. Um, I don't know. Do you guys think I'm over exaggerating? I think he's definitely been on the decline in his career. So I I don't see if you're looking at where the oh, Flyers nine. are trying to go. Right. Um, it doesn't really make too much sense. Kind of based on you know their their foreseeable future here to add a guy that's that age and has been declining as you said i mean he can always bounce back could could have been you know a terrible season from him obviously but i don't know like i think it's more about the guys are trying to get rid of i think it's more about getting rid of the sandheim in the eight-year term attached to him and then the three years attached to hayes and the salary versus actually getting krug essentially yeah and i understand that but like going off of what jones said like is there a chance that that actually wasn't it? It's actually not Tory Krug. Like, I, mean, I know everybody's like, possible. <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't seem that appealing. Somebody like Pareko, yeah, seems appealing, and I can understand why even Scott Lawton's name comes up in that type of scenario because we'd have to add right because Pareko is a better player and younger. Yeah, it's like that's what I feel like. I don't know that when I hear you're trying to build from the back end out. Bringing in a guy like Tory Krug, it's not going to help us too much. It's going to create a similar scenario that we had with Ghost, and then we have a TDA. Is that offensive defensemen are not great at defense, and our coach has zero tolerance for it? I don't know, Connor. What do you? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think I maybe uh, Keith Jones was telling the truth that you know maybe it wasn't Krug, and maybe it was. I know Scandella's name has been thrown out there. Marco Scandella, I think he's a right shot defenseman. It's a yeah, one right year handed. deal. And that's one year, so it makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, he's one year, three mil. Definitely a doable contract. You just have him uh, back there in the blue line for a year, and then you let him walk next year. No, tra- no real harm, no foul. Tra- yeah, tra- he's tra- flippable at the deadline there, too. Uh, another Sean Walker situation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Um, there's, I who knows because there's been so many names thrown around from honestly from both sides. I saw Kairu's name was out there yeah. uh, for a second there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Justin Falk as well too. So yeah, who who really knows? But if it was Krug, even though he declined the uh, the trade, he kind of uh, killed the trade there. That's still he's earned that right. He's been in the league long enough now. He negotiated that into his deal. Uh even if it was like a flat cap, something I'm not sure exactly when he signed that deal, but yeah. uh, uh, a couple seasons he, ago. Yeah, it's really smart on his part, knowing that the cap was flat, take a little bit less and give yourself the the security of knowing that 
you're in control of your own future. You're you're going to be in the same spot for five, six, seven years, however long he signed the deal for. It's it's his right, and there's nothing wrong with with what he was, he was doing. He was a UFA, so that's what you do as a UFA. That's how Sanheim had leverage over Fletcher. Look how that look that contract. He's only slightly overpaid, but he also got max term. He got slightly overpaid, and he got a no trade clause. Yeah. Well, you have to look at it this way, right? Obviously, St. Louis values Sanheim more than they value Krug because technically Krug's cap hit six point five million. Sanheim six point twenty five million. Yeah, exactly, right. So, like for for the Flyers' perspective, you're technically downgrading for what is it? Krug has what four four more seasons left on that contract? Four, four more seasons at six. So you're swapping. You're swapping 25. basically. You're swapping basically the same exact cap hit for four less years at that point, but. I think too the Flyers so for getting a guy who's going to be thirty six when he yeah done. yeah exactly I think the Flyers acquiring him in that deal like I said it's more about getting out from under the other two but it's also probably like hey we'll see how this works out and you know as the deal gets kind of shorter and there's two three years left maybe we try to trade him again who knows right like absolutely I would imagine I would imagine the conversation was we're going to flip him immediately. Yeah, I try to get more assets, exactly. Because uh, I see why he doesn't want to come here. Doesn't Rebuild. make sense for him. Yeah. He's yep. 32 years old. I guess Wants he doesn't have a cup. Yeah, but he's locked in for four years, not coming here on a one-year deal to see how it is. He doesn't want to get stuck here for four years or just get bought out and then be homeless or whatever just because we're playing <laughs> games. Anybody who's mad at him, by the way, for turning it down, you're out of your mind. I would say 99% of players are going to utilize that and go. No. Yeah, why wouldn't you, right? That's the why only I'm thing trying to trade um, Sanheim. He's the old, yeah, the, my only thought process was, I think last night, uh, I mean, there were some rumblings on Twitter and online that uh, maybe Krug actually was, there was some movement on the you know trade clause front and things like that. Uh, my thoughts pertaining that and maybe why he would eventually shift is, if you're a player... Mm -hmm. um and you're kind of realizing hey this team likely does not want me around they're shopping me they're trying to get rid of me usually players will wave at the end of the day because they don't want to be somewhere where they're not wanted not saying that that's the case but i mean if he does end up waving maybe that's the thought process from krug's end uh versus why he didn't do it earlier right he probably maybe at first had an initial reaction then kind of thought about it and was like well why would i want to be somewhere where these guys don't want me anyhow right so i think that's something to keep in mind but personally for me i mean We'll see what happens at the draft and, and Briere and Armstrong get face to face. Maybe they can iron something out. But with the NTC um, kind of getting kicked in from Krug's side, it seems like this may fall through at least the Sandheim Krug part of the deal. I think Hayes still might go, but yeah. it looks like those two may not uh, be swapped for each other, I don't think. And finally, just to kind of jump in here, there's a human element to this too. Like I read online somewhere that Krug was on vacation and you know, when you're on vacation, the last thing you want to be thinking about is what am I going to do with the next four years of my life? Like, what city am I going to be living in? That's time to relax. Everyone knows it's vacation. Like, you don't want to be – the last thing you want to be doing is thinking – is making a life-changing decision. It's like, let me get back from where I'm at first. And then we'll then think I'll about get it. Together. Yeah, I'll get together with my family. I'll think about it, and then we'll come to a decision, and I'll let my agent know. Yeah, so, that's a great well, point. Look, I think if you be honest with you, what I was thinking about, I was like, if Ivan Provorov was here, it would be a lot easier to sell a defenseman like that. It'd be like, hey, we have a top pairing role for you. We want to put you with Ivan Provorov. You know who he is. But when you're literally trading Travis Sanheim, you're going, oh, we want to put you with 21 year old Cam York to be our top pairing defense. He's only 5'11, and yeah. you're 5'9. It's like who where is he even gonna play? Like he I don't know. I just don't I don't blame him at all. That's why I kind of look, I'm not saying anybody's a liar. I trust that they those are the names they heard. You know, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not even trying, not even trying to get inside scoop. Like I don't care. But I look at that if I'm in Briere's position, I go, okay, I have an opportunity to make my if you really want Sandheim, then I want like I want Colton Pareko. I want your first. I'll give you Scott Lawton. Like, that's why I think the trade kept getting bigger. Because I think if you really want to get better, like, how is just a first and Krug, and then hopefully you get Matvey Mitchkov, 
It's like, okay, these are just like not great guarantees on moves. I'm like, I would want if I'm if I'm Keith Jones, right? And I'm saying I want to build from the back end out. Colton Pareko, somebody is like, okay, he's 30, but I'll take that guy for the next six years because he's a monster and he's got some two way upside, the same way as Risto. And all of a sudden, you have a Risto line and Pareko back end. You know, you can throw a young Cam York with Colton Pareko. Like, that's where I was like, oh, this trade is getting interesting to me. But like, if it's just to like acquire Tory Krug and then just like get stuck with another bad contract. I'm like, I don't know. I guess I, I wanted something better than that. That's why I'm almost like I don't want to believe fully the rumor we heard that it was just Krug and a first because I was like, I don't know what we do with him. You know, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of scraps. Like I liked I liked the the Provorov trade, but we are stuck with uh what's the name? Peterson now. Yeah. I, at least you can make the argument there that we didn't have NHL go- goalies. We had two young guys in heart. You know, so he's so. your backup. But yeah, I see your point. Like, you don't want to take on too many bad contracts unless the assets that you're accruing because of that are substantial, right? So, just the late first. Yeah, no. you'd want more. You'd want more. But I, I guess we'll see where it goes. I mean, I, I don't know um, if Sandheim's still going to get moved. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet on it. Like you just got to look at his deal and what's out there. But uh, I think Hayes for sure. We'll see. We'll probably see get moved. Uh, Sandheim's probably up in the air at this point. I think I think Sandheim is a draft. Go ahead, go, yeah. Connor. You look what you want to say. Yeah, I think uh, on the Sandheim front, it will be obviously that we know there's a market out there now for him. There's some teams interested. St. Louis, obviously. Uh, I heard Winnipeg was thrown around there. The Maybe league. Ottawa. Yeah, that some of the Canadian teams. But do would teams wait until after July first because that's when the no movement clause kicks in, or would they? I don't think try and get trade, it done the, sooner. The trade wouldn't be available for them. You know, I think I don't think that the Flyers want Sanheim knowing that they're trying to trade him because it's because then they can't, you know, then they have to go get his permission. I think this is the only opportunity at the draft really to move Sanheim. And I think they, from what I can tell, it seems like they, this is what I would have done. Provov was the cutoff age for me and so is TK, but anybody 26. And or 27 and over, I'd even say, which Sandheim falls in that category, I would trade you. O- almost any single person. Anybody who's like 25 and under, I would keep. So like, if you look at Sandheim here for eight years, you're like, well, if you had a three-year deal, we'd hold you because we can trade you at the end of your deal or something. Yeah. But we don't know where this team's going to be. So they're just trying to flush everyone out. Um, do you guys think that Kevin Hayes in that St. Louis deal would have had like 25, 50% retained as well. Uh, I would agree. Yeah. They're definitely going to probably eat and it's some definitely money not back. worth it. Yeah. Right? It just is. It, I think it is what it is. Cause I think the whole, the whole um, benefit for St. Louis um, is you're getting some guys that they think can help, but then you're also not, um, you know, getting killed on the cap as well. Right, like they don't want to take them both at full value. I don't think, but if the Flyers are eating salary in that situation, you'd have to hope that maybe instead of the 29th pick, it's obviously the 25th. I don't think the Blues are going to trade that. What what do they have? 15th as well. Yeah, that's definitely not in play. They're not trading at all. Unless TK was going the other way. Yeah, exactly. So who knows? I mean, I think the rumor was that if. Hayes was just to go to St. Louis, it would be either 25% or 50 retained and then like a second rounder or something along those lines, yeah. which that makes sense, I guess, if that's just what 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 it is straight up, right? Oh, you're saying straight up? Yeah. It would 50% be a second and a second rounder? Yeah, I yeah. think that's appropriate. Connor, what do you think? If it was... I, I don't know, I might be off here, but if yeah, it was Hayes and Sanheim and going the one way and then Krug and the first coming back... Uh, it's only a difference of four spots, but do you think uh, Doug Armstrong would have said, if you retain 50, we'll give you 25, but if it's like 30 or 25, then we'll give you 29? Yeah, I would That's imagine. probably, it's yeah, possible. that makes sense. The the different, but at that point, it's like, do we really want to lock up for several years just so much money allocated? Because we're going to have to eat cap on TDA, and we have to eat cap on Hayes. You know, and oh, we might have to buy somebody. It's just like, I just feel like 
I'm hoping, let's just say, I'm hoping that Danny Briere surprises us. Because even the Cal Peterson trade, okay? Peterson's on a two-year deal. Short-term deal. Walker, one year. Immediately, in my head, if I'm GM, I'm like, those are so manageable. Yeah. Even the five, even the five million two two year, because one, if he improves, I can move him. And two, if not, I'll hold him. Whatever. And then maybe I buy him out. It won't be the worst thing ever if I have to. You know, but I'll probably hold him for two years and that's it. It'll just be a backup goalie here or something. But it's two years. And then on top of that, you got the first, you got a second to compensate, another second to compensate, and a young defenseman that you can project into the NHL. Just like I just when I heard the trade last night, it's almost like when I heard the beginning of the Provrov trade, where people were like, Oh, Provrov, and he got us a first. And I was like, Ugh. It's like that sucks. I was like, that return stinks. And then by the end of the return, when I heard what he actually got, I was like, that's really good. That's smart, you know? And he had to take some salary, but it was smart. You could look on paper and see even one. I didn't get that feeling from the the first and Tory Krug trade. I was kind of like, okay. Especially if Lawton was involved. Then I'm just like, well, we just got hosed. Yeah, if Lawton's involved, you got to get a lot more back. Um, I think Wasn't that the rumor, though? Was the if he, three, he three was involved them. too, just for Krug in the first, I mean that'd be a huge overpay. If that if that was the rumor, that's a terrible trade for the Flyers. But um, I I think for Hayes, like it makes sense. Um, I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna retain fifty percent, what's he seven point one four million? So that's almost four million for three years. Yeah. That's not the greatest. I mean I've always said like if you're gonna retain on Hayes, about you know getting him to be a five million dollar player, that's the sweet spot, and I don't think. You know, two point one four million for three years is going to kill you, especially with the caps probably going to go up a little bit. Um, so that wouldn't be too bad. I think it's more just obviously you got to make sure you don't retain on Sandheim because he's locked Eight in for years. so long. So that would be where I'm like, okay, it has to be straight up at that point. Um, and then in terms of TDA, I guess we'll get into him afterwards, but that's a one year deal, so that's fine too. If you're going to retain on him, right? Right. Yeah, that one makes sense. I, I'm cool with anything in the short term. It's when we get into the long term. And, you know, Connor, maybe you, because I know Vasily agrees with me at least. I don't go into this going, oh, it's going to take five, six years to do this. I'm kind of, every year we're going to just reevaluate. We'll see how this year goes. And then we'll make this, excuse me, we'll make decisions from there. We'll see how the next year goes. So to take a, you know, you can manage a two year thing. Okay, I can project this being out. But when you're talking about buying a contract out or holding somebody for four years, it's like you don't really know where you're going to be in four years. You know what I mean? You don't know what kind of players are going to be in this team, what kind of contracts you're going to need. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a fair point. It's good to uh, obviously you want to after every year take a step back and reevaluate. But I think we're still in the phase of at least the rebuild where you want to finish kind of stripping down the down the parts that you're not going to keep. Like obviously the Hayes, the Sanheim, uh Provera was already gone, Lawton might go, whatever they want to do with Connect Knee, whatever they want to do with Hart. Um so at that point, like after you kind of get rid of the guys that you don't want and you have a core of young ish guys or young guys, then you can kinda every year is where you get into your reevaluation mode. And all those guys that I just mentioned could possibly be gone this summer we could go into training camp with the average age of the team being like 23 or 24 yeah but at the same time uh whenever you are taking bad contracts back in return or you are retaining some money i kind of look at it as it's one bad contract on the team like hayes if you retain four mil uh that's for tony d'angelo is going to be two and a half so you're up to a, a bad six and a half mil contract uh and then however much you have to retain on anyone else you move um and the, obviously like facility said the cap's going to go up every year uh you're hoping that it starts to go up a bit more than it has been i think it's only going to be another one mil going up this, this year. year yeah so Very slim and yeah if, projected for the following year i think it's supposed to be going up to 88 potentially 88 million so. Yeah, so that's a pretty nice bump. And then if you are coming out of this year and you're only holding six and a half from Hayes and T'Angelo, then you just look at that as a one year, six and a half million dollar player that you just don't have. So I don't know. I could be off with that. Uh, what do you guys think? So do you have anything in? 
Uh, you first, Sharif. Go ahead. No, I, I look. My whole thing is just I. I'm not a hundred percent sure how good this team. I think there's just too much up in the air. There's too much dead cap space. We have nobody even talks about Ryan Ellis, who by the way is going to be on LTIR forever. That's what I mean. Can we really afford where some of these naturally will just go away in a shorter amount of time than us? This I just don't want us getting into that Chuck Fletcher thing where oh we got to get rid of this problem, so let's find the quickest solution now. I got to get rid of. Uh, Goss is I have to get rid of Goss. I have to. So I'm going to trade a second and a seventh to get him. I'll, I got to get another defenseman. So I'm going to trade a second and a third or whatever to get four. Yeah. Yeah. You can just see the desperation in these moves. And I'm just, I don't think that that's what Danny Briere is doing. I think it's more of like, oh, you guys want Scott Lawton? You want Scott Lawton? First, second, and a prospect. And they're like, what? And they're like, oh, you want Carter Hart? Yeah, I want the best prospect on your team and two first round picks. And they're like, what? And I think he's just asking really high for everything and trying to get like 80% of that along the way. But I just all the scenarios that we hear that I to me, they come off as so desperate still, where it's like, oh my God, like screw you, Tori Krug, for not coming here. How dare you stop us from getting rid of Sandheim and and Hayes as if that's like a humongous win. I, I don't know. It's just like even the, the rumor that was it, – it wasn't that exciting of a rumor, at least to me. Like a late first-round pick and getting an aging defenseman that is going to be a problem on this team is not really like – I'm not excited for the future you know, because of that. The Provorov trade, though, made me excited. So I don't know. I I, get, I'm, I hate rumors. Connor, you don't know this, but Vasily knows this. I hate rumors. I hate. I don't hate people who spread who, who say the rumors. I don't hate them, but I hate them for the reason that we experienced the other night. All night, everybody, everybody, the most trusted people, Drager, Elliot. I can't shit on these people. They're, it's a done deal. We get two days later. This trade is not even close. It's in fact, it's most likely dead. And and it's not the problem that people know the information, but it takes us on this like emotional roller coaster of this is what's happening, and then you know. Nothing ever happens, or at least most of them. Like eighty percent of the time, that's the case. I think we just have to remember a lot of times, like when these trades get leaked before they happen, that there's a reason why the information is out there. Some there's some reason as to why it's out there. Like right. who point. knows which side's feeding the information and what they're trying to do with getting it out there. But that's something to to evaluate too, right? Like maybe there's a team that wants more out of, out of another side or. You know, St. Louis wants more of the Flyers, vice versa, or there's other players that they want to kind of try to get involved into the trade. So we'll see what happens. I, I personally think with this one, like I was like uh, I was saying before, um, in terms of the dead cap space, it wouldn't be the biggest deal just because Hayes is gone in three years anyway. I th- just think it's more the fact that, like, okay, you took away Sandheim, I mean, who's a pretty decent defenseman, probably – you know, third, uh, number three on most teams, potentially. Yeah. And then you take he's Hayes. Being, 50- he's in your top four. Yeah. Sure. And then you take Hayes, who's a 50 point player. And I mean, you're getting the first and Krug. So Krug, I think, would be negative value. It's really just the first that you're looking at and just moving on from contract. So realistically, it's probably the first round pick and what you can do with more. that. Yeah. It it's, to be it, more. it's the first round pick and what you can do with that um, at the draft that entices fans, really, right? Like, yeah. can you trade up? Can you package it to get even a better player? I think that's where where I, what it comes down to for the Flyers. I, I totally agree. I I would imagine the package had more than that coming yeah. from St. Louis. I I just can't see Breer accepting that. Couple offer. more picks or at least a pros some prospects you like like a Jake Neighbors something like that. Because he he can still trade Scott Law. Like I know we want to hold Scott Law, but Scott Law's twenty nine years old. You know what I mean? Or twenty eight years old? Maybe he's not twenty nine. But think he's he's twenty nine. Yeah, he's getting up there. Okay, he's not. He might not be here. Anyway, when his contract runs out, right? Like he might want too much money. And if we're eating all this goddamn nonsense from other teams, we might not have the money to give him because he's going to be demanding more money because he deserves it. He's a good player. Um, so what do you guys think about? Let's let's move on to the bigger name here. Um, I don't I still don't expect him to be traded. Um, and I think if he doesn't get traded this year, I just I don't see it happening. Like, unless the Flyers like are not. You know, maybe it'll happen next year, but I think like this would be the season to trade him if you're going to trade him. But TK, um, I think rumors are kind of died down a little bit. Um, I, I hear hear the Oilers come up again. I don't think they have the assets to get it done. Um, they do if you're desperate, but not for me. If I'm not desperate, 
then I want something really good, like not a question. Like I did see the one rumor out there, and tell me if you guys heard this rumor. This is an easy yes. That's why I don't believe it. But Lafreniere and New York's first for TK. I did hear New York was pursuing him. Value-wise, it's actually on point. It's a top prospect and a late first-round pick. And because of Lafreniere was a former first overall pick, you know, obviously on the surface it looks like ridiculous. But you know, he hasn't necessarily panned out. But that's the type of guy. That's the type of situation. I would consider trading him for former first overall pick and give me another first round to try to compensate. Cause hopefully if Lafreniere is not as good as TK, I get something else. Um, Connor, I'll go to you on that one. What do you think about that rumor? And what do you think about the potential of TK getting moved like between now and the draft? Uh, just starting off with the Lafreniere deal. I would probably do that. I think that's uh that's a pretty safe deal for, for the flyers. I don't know about the word safe. No deal is ever safe, but it's a pretty solid deal. Uh, like you said, getting a former first overall pick back, uh, one that was held in pretty high regard, obviously not held in the Bedard regard here, but he was, he was someone who was really projected to kind of take the lead by storm, maybe similar to maybe similar to Jack Hughes or he shared down there in Jersey. But um, I think getting him, cause he's been buried on the third, fourth line, like limited, limited power play time, not really playing a whole lot. Uh, but his numbers have increased every year. They're not great, but they're they are getting up there a little bit. So I think bringing him, uh, Lafreniere over to a team where you know you can play him top six, you can play him on the power play, uh, and just basically give him a chance to succeed. You would have to re-sign him because I think he's a I think he's an RFA this summer. Let's double check. Um, you might be right. Yeah, and then obviously, like, you get the first back as well. Um, I'm assuming that would be this year. Uh, but just moving off to if he could be traded at all this summer, I think if you are going to trade him, now is definitely the, the time to trade him because TK is one of those guys where if he's cold, he's kind of cold all year because he had the one, the two really good years, uh, his second and third year. Uh, I think he, then he re-signed, and then he had the COVID year, which he led the team at points. I think he had 27 or 24, 37, 61, something like that. Uh, and then he had two kind of down-ish years, and then he just had this year. So top uh, team's leading score, point per game, 30 goals. Uh, even with the injury, I think his value is – the highest that it's ever been so if you're going to move him now is probably the time to do it um and yeah it's i think now would just have to be the time to do it yeah no that makes sense for connecting uh connor i, I think personally like just to answer your question you with uh the lafreniere deal i think from the flyers perspective they obviously would take the trade yeah i, I think it makes sense Maybe for the head. flyers it makes sense for the flyers right just because obviously the center depth that they lack. They don't really have anybody projected that can be a top line center right now. I mean, you have Gautier, but who knows if he's a center at the NHL level and you have your question marks with Couturier other than Elliot Desnoyers, there's not really anybody in the system at center that's going to project to be a top two guy for you. So I think for the Flyers, they kind of have to look to start Maybe filling. Um, yeah. Frost obviously too. Yeah. I for, I'm forgetting him, but I mean, uh, you're Could I think for the fl- I, I think for know. the Flyers, yeah, you're um sorry man, you interrupted no, no, no. me a bit, but uh I, know. Sorry. I think I think for the Flyers, I mean it's it's a good you know exercise to try to get a center, things like that. Uh are the Rangers gonna do that deal and trade a first overall? I think you're fucking crazy. Like personally, I don't think they're gonna trade him at all. Um and the reason being and is because think about it, he's 21 years old, right? Where did Jack Hughes break out just as, in his 22 year old season, which would be next season for Lafreniere? Like he's, it's still too early, very early. I just don't think they're going to move him. Like those rumors online, I kind of balk at, I kind of laughed when I saw that, to be honest, I'm kind of like, yeah, it would be good for the flyers, but the Rangers aren't going to make that uh, deal. And if they are, they're going to ask for more than connecting probably too. So I- I think to to that point, I think that's what we asked for. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I think I think like, and this is why I don't like rumors because it's like, yeah, that if if I'm asking the Rangers and they go, okay, you want 
my potential 40 goal scorer who's, who's in his mid 20s, who's locked up for what three more years at five million, something yeah. like that, like nothing for what he's producing. Oh, and he's gritty and he's a young Marchand essentially. Um, yeah, I want your best prospect. I think like for this, the Rangers, connecting I want your makes, best young player. That's yeah, what I, want. I think for the Rangers, connecting makes sense because of where they're at. And they're probably frustrated with Lafreniere and the fact that he hasn't right, reached that's why the peaks. I, that's, that's why he came out. Yeah, right? exactly. He ha- it hasn't reached the peaks. I just don't think New York's close to giving up on him, right? Like, I don't think so either. Maybe, maybe Kakao, you think? Maybe. You see, that I could see. That I could see for sure because he's a winger as well. I just don't know um, from the Rangers' perspective because like, you have Zabanejad. Well, I think, I think Lafreniere is playing wing for the Rangers, but I think he does have potential at C, right? Yeah, I exactly. He's right? done that in the NHL yet. He's played center they're, for them some Their some numbers bit. are very similar. He's played center for them right. some bit. I, I just don't know um, if they're they're going to be willing to want to move him because think about their depth at center too. You take away Lafreniere, you really have Zabanejad, and then who else? Philip Hedl. 23 uh, and that's you know what i mean like it doesn't look that that great for them either so i guess i don't know who they have internally i Is think Goudreau the, center i know uh, i think they uh, might want to move uh, off him though winger. he's a winger as well yeah, yeah so who knows but. they have some guys in the minors but i don't know how good they are and i don't know their system that well but yeah no i i think it's a great point um they're also you know tarasenko's a there. ufa patrick kane is going to test ufa um yeah, I look. I I think the value makes sense. Yeah, I don't think the Rangers would be jumping to make that trade. I don't no. think they'd be looking because if you're wrong on that and Lafreniere oh, breaks out next year and and he's just as good, dude. What we failed to mention is this is all in division. When you see the Rangers trade with the Flyers, it's very rare, especially players of this caliber. The last one was Eric well, Lindros going to the Rangers, but. So. So the one the one thing I will say is like I look back at that stupid Derek Broussard trade that um the Rangers won back in the day when they traded with for the Sens, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's that different where it's like a uh or even the Martin Erat Philip Forsberg trade. And those are mistakes. I'd argue. Yeah, that's those what trades. I mean. But the reason those teams made those mistakes is because they looked at an NHL guarantee. Yeah. I don't think TK is a mistake. I think he's a guarantee. He's going to be an 80-point player in your team. He's going to be rough and tumble. He's going to be annoying. He's signed for cheap. That's, that's a pretty good guarantee for a team that's like, okay, well, maybe Lafreniere is going to break out. What if it takes him two, three years, and we already have a cup-winning team here, and I need somebody to get under people's skin in the playoffs? Same reason why Ryan Leonard is rumored to be going at fifth overall. You know, yeah. that's, that's the only way I can see that. It, but I do agree with you, Vasily. The odds that the Rangers are ready to walk away from him at this point Seems pretty unlikely. You yeah. Know? Even for TK. Just seems unlikely. I just I don't think for the Flyers in general, like Konechny, Lawton, I don't think they're going to be willing to move them unless it's a strict overpay. I think that's what Breer is looking for. If you overpay right. me for them, I will take them. And if it's a fair well, value first, yeah, that's, that's an right? overpay. <laughs> exactly. If it's a fair, if it's a fair deal, I think the Flyers probably just keep them because it's like, hey, we we know these guys, they work well with Tortorella. There's always the there's always the chance with the torts factor that whoever you're going to bring in, who knows how that's going to work out, right? Yeah. So at least you know with Lawton and Konechny, you, you kind of, what, the devil you know, right? What like if it's you know a straight swap? Lafreniere for Konechny? Just straight, no first. Straight up? I think that becomes more enticing for the Rangers. Um, for the Flyers, I mean, I, I probably would still do it. I mean, it's a former first overall pick, man. Like, uh, I just look at you the odds. Risk. Yeah, reward. It's, I mean, it's just for reward, like, right? I, I just look at the odds of the fact that, like, team. usually, I mean, guys that are first overall, if they don't jump right into the league, it takes them two to three years to figure it out. Like, I expect, to be honest, I expect Lafreniere to have a pretty big year next year. I wouldn't be surprised hey, if he plays really well. So that's like, why I want. That's why I want to do the trade. <laughs> yeah, that's why it would be good for the Flyers. I just don't know if the Rangers would do it. Unfortunately, I don't think so either. I think if we get overly excited about it, there's a reason about it. You know what I mean? Oh, like if, if it seems like we're walking away with a win, like if I, I kind of, I don't know if you remember the Martin Erat for Philip Forsberg trade, like at the time that that was like, you do you even know who Martin Erat is? Do you know who that is? No, that was a little bit before me. Okay. Yeah. So like great was, player like, play for Nashville, well, played, but yeah. even at his best, he was a second line winger, 30 goal scorer on the second line. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. He was second yeah. line winger overplaying his value on a, on a Nashville team that was always scrappy and played really well defensively, but offense always fell short. This is the old Nashville pre- predators, the uh, Shea Weber 
uh, Ryan Suter, Nashville Predators. And they and the Capitals fighting for a playoff spot thought that Erat was going to solve all their problems. They brought this guy in at an older age on a one-year deal for their best offensive prospect. Who got was bounced in the first round. Philip Forsberg, and then they got bounced in the first round, and Erat did nothing for their team. Um, yeah. But again, the illusion there that their GM was under is, hey, I need a guarantee of a guy who's been a playoff performer, which he was, who's shown to be scrappy, who he, which he was. You know, and the only thing that they would accept because they didn't have to get rid of Erat was that guy. So that's why in my head, I'm like, if we are talking about trading any one of these guys where the Flyers are today, there is no reason to budge on anyone except for Sanheim because he has a timeline. But everybody else, it's like, wait till you get a good offer. Maybe, maybe Hayes because he's unacceptable here anymore, which do you guys believe that that's true? I heard that going around too, that that Tortorella does not want Kevin Hayes in this locker room next year. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, right? If, if, if they don't, if they don't get along, I just, I just think it's writing on the wall in the sense of look how he used him to end the season. Um, and you kind of see that he didn't use him in a top line role. didn't he, use him in a second line role. He also um, diminished Scott Lawton's role. At the end of the yeah. Th- and I think that's telling too. I think that's telling in general. We talked about this uh, on prior episodes, but I think it's telling to the fact that like, you're seeing where the Flyers are going, right? And they're trying to go towards their younger guys. And it's just happening naturally, right? Like, And it's funny to me because Tortorella was always a guy viewed as, oh, I'm going to play the veterans. I'm going to play the veterans. And he's not playing the veterans. No. There's a reason for that, right? He's actually favoring uh, the young guys. Yeah, and I, I think he even knows he needs to work on the development of the players and the younger players that they have. So I think it's just writing on the wall for Hayes. I don't know if it's an attitude thing or what happens in the room or what's going on. Like we're not there to speculate, but I'm sure there's some sort of reason why that's been thrown out there. I, I say, just look at the play in the last half of the season and it kind of dictates it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hayes. I feel like he's kind of, everyone knew that he wasn't going to stay the entire contract. Uh, it was kind of a, it was a good signing uh, for where they were. Cause they didn't know uh, about Nolan Patrick. Cause he had the mind green thing. Uh, good first year, injured pretty much the whole second year. Um, all star this year, tied his career high in points. But I think after he came back from that all star break was when the wheels kind of fell off for him. Yeah. Um, like you guys said, the writing's pretty much on the wall. He ended up getting his position changed from center to wing. Uh, so I don't know if he's completely like you. No matter what, you can't bring him back. Like how they might view D'Angelo. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, I don't know why he's not a, why he's not someone that you definitely don't want to bring back. Like I, he's a productive player. He's still overly dramatic. Doesn't he? Yeah. He's still a pretty decent, uh, middle six guy. I mean, he's any contender would want him. The avalanche before they got, uh, Johansson, he would, he would have been a good fit there. Um, but yeah, it's like I don't know why the relationship is so between him and Tortorella is so fractured. I think if you can fix that, and I don't know if there way if there is a way to do that, but if you can fix it, then he's definitely still someone that you can keep here. Uh, the way that they're kind of trimming salary, his contract's not going to kill you that much this year. Yeah. Um, depends depends what they do next year, but. Obviously, there's still a lot of young guys in there. They're going to need to look at someone. Um, and I think Scott Lawton's kind of becoming that guy that they're looking to. Maybe Tortorella's Bellino, in a sense, from his Columbus days. Just kind of just throw him out there, any situation. He'll do the dirty work. He'll get his hands dirty, um, go to those areas. He'll find a way to make an impact on the game, whether he's scoring goals, blocking shots, whatever it is, killing penalties. Um yeah, that's. But just going back to Hayes, I like. I just I just don't know why he's being shown the door so fast. It's kind of it's yeah. so it's so over dramatic. It that that's my whole. Thing. It's like it's like oh he, he had a bad thing with the coach. Get the hell out of here. Trade him at all. It's like I'm so sick of this. Even so, I agree with you in the sense that Kevin Hayes is a good player to sign to your team. But when that contract was signed. Again, this is why I don't love the UFA market. I mean, we paid a guy, 
Yeah, we knew we were overpaying for him. We knew we were overpaying for JVR, and we did that too. What you do in UFA though, naturally, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, because they traded for him, right? Yeah. yeah, but they knew that they had to overpay him. Sorry, they knew no, they no, had no, to I'm overpay him, or else he would just go. But like, here, walk. here's my here. Is that actually true, or is that what losers say? Don't don't. And I'm not trying to call you guys losers. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? For instance, Tampa Bay. What contract have they signed where everybody's like, well, <laughs> they obviously had to lose that contract or Detroit. They yeah, obviously fair. had. No, you don't. No, you don't. You set a precedent. You stop overpaying players and you do that over a span of time till you have look at Carolina. They don't have to do that. Why do we? They, yeah. This is what I'm trying to say. I think that we is, did it for them. <laughs> fair they, enough, dude. They win twice on this one. In fact, they would oh, yeah. win twice. And make, <laughs> yeah. both of our GMs look stupid by refusing to overpay for players. Even the Sandheim trade, okay? If he made five and a half million and didn't break the six, I don't know if we'd be rushing to get rid of him because perception even alone changes that, being under $6 million for a defenseman who plays 21 minutes a night, right? Yeah. It's like it, the whole thing is like we have to fight for every one of these inches and stop overpaying for guys being like, nope, we're not going to do it. I think just back to the Hayes thing. Um, I mean, personally, he's not a bad player. 50 points, no. you could use him. If he I made just, $5 million, nobody would be rushing to get rid of oh, him. Oh, yeah, exactly. I just think what it is is likely, I mean, we all know how Tortorella is. I mean, I'm not there, and I don't know what the relationship is, but who knows what's said between them. But I also want to point out, too, that like it might be overblown that it isn't repairable as well. I think it's just a narrative at this point that like Hayes is on the way out. I think his negative of... value is overblown, too. That, I think too, yeah. I think, right. I think it's just a narrative that he's on the way out. And, I mean, the player probably seems like he wants to kind of get out of here, too, just based on you know his play on the ice and his lack of interest uh, on the ice. It'll be interesting to see if he gets moved. I think it probably is likely to happen, but we'll ultimately see where he goes, right? Any player around 30 should want to leave this team right yeah. now. At least for the, the next year. You know, unless you want a cup. Because you're not winning a cup next year. Yeah. And you have to factor in too, like... They're not one even thing trying. I'll... The team that's hiring yeah. you is not even trying to win a cup. Sorry, go ahead. One thing I'll mention is like... Uh, you know, people can wonder why does Breer want to trade this guy? Why, why does he want to move on from this guy? But like, these aren't the guy. He didn't sign these guys. He didn't trade for these guys. He might not have ever wanted any of these guys. So like, I can look at it from his perspective and say, hey, like, I want to get rid of these guys because I want to do my own thing, um, and I want to build the team the way that I see fit. So we'll see, right? Like, what he ends up getting back. I just hope if that's his perspective that he isn't losing trade to just move guys that he doesn't want because he didn't bring them in here, right? So, Right. Changes for changes' sake. Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. I'm wondering what happens if this year Hayes ends up coming back. They, like you said, you either win the trade or you don't move him. Yeah. They find a way to bring Hayes back. Briere goes to Tortorella and says, listen, we're going to move him at the deadline. Keep him top line, top six, whatever. Put him in the power play. Let him just go out there and and play free because the first half of the year he's playing free probably after connecting probably the flyers best forward in the first half of the year i know he's point per game for the first 35 ish yeah he's 40 games 80 point pace yeah yeah so i mean you come to the deadline you're 55 60 games in he's sitting at 45 points second line center i like what team is not going to want there's less term on the contract you can afford to eat more uh, yeah. Eat more salary because you're going to have a better picture of moving forward. You're going to have a better picture of who's on the roster. Uh, if Sandheim's gone, you won't have to deal with that salary. You're going to have to eat money on D'Angelo's, but it's only one year. So that's not really much of a problem. If that's the scenario, then like, what is the harm in just keeping him for another half year? I don't think there is. Like We talked about this last week, uh, Connor, that... I mean, keeping him for extra time technically, I think, brings more value because you're taking less term off. Or, I mean, you're taking more term off the deal, right? So there's going to be less term for whatever team does acquire him. And then technically, at the deadline, you know as a team exactly what shape you're in and what you need, right? Like, now it's kind of mm -hmm. you're projecting as to where you'll be. Whereas I, at the deadline, a team's going to know, okay, I do need this piece. I do need him here. Right? I guess. So. I guess the argument in the case to move him quickly though i do agree with what both both of you said 
is well, we we have windows, right? We have now, right? Summer, and then deadline, yeah. And then we have maybe All Star break, maybe, yeah. then trade deadline, and that's it. And then and then all of a sudden you're holding him another year. That's a fair but, point for hockey, for sure, for sure. Yeah, but I think I think that's why we hear it like a scramble to do it now. I just don't know why people are like, oh, he's got to leave. Like every year, people said this about Goss's Bear until inevitably he was traded in a horrible trade for our team. Like that was what you guys wanted to see. And again, I, I brought this joke with you, Vasily. You remember this for sure. When Tony D'Angelo was signed here, I was like, okay, if they don't expect him to be bad at defense, why are you bringing in an offensive defenseman? Again, Tory Krug, another one. And when we get to the draft, I'll talk about defensemen. You talk about it's like our coach is not going to play an offensive defenseman. He's not going to play him. He's yeah, unless you're responsible, unless you're responsible in your own end, somewhat. I mean, so, writing well, on the wall. I just don't like. I don't like this surprise we brought over an, a highly offensive guy, and he's not great at D. Surprise, you know. It's like that happens so often. Should have known better, essentially, right? Yeah. Well, I just don't want to hear anymore because it's like it wasn't a smart. Like the people can say it's revisionist history, but all of that these decision makings that Fletcher made, the desperately get rid of ghosts, desperately like none of this should ever happen again. Ever, ever again. Those are embarrassing traits. They embarrassed us publicly. You saw Ghost and 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 I remember when when TDA was signed here, everybody said how much better he was defensively than Ghost and how oh he's he's so much better. They're the same. They're the same. They're the same caliber of player, same caliber of offense. They're slightly different in their style, but they're about the same. It's pretty pretty spot on. Let's be real here, right? And people denied it though. Everybody wants to freak out over a player's uh downside right the fact that an offensive defenseman's not good at d put a horrible team in front of eric carlson you tell me if he puts up 100 points uh regularly they were scoring at least that team they yeah. still stunk defensively at least he had a great season but that guy on a bad defensive team is going to look even worse any any one of these offensive defensemen will crumble in the yeah they got to be next to a good partner who can hold the hold them up essentially defensively look at look at D'Angelo next to Jacob Slavin right he didn't look uh, half as bad so there you go yeah and I I would still argue the the best that D'Angelo looked was with Provorov yeah I would say that he true. just that, brought that him well. down they didn't yeah. they didn't take. D'Angelo off because it was making pro Rob worse. They made it because D'Angelo was having turnovers and he was creating odd man rushes. Yeah, it was bad. Him and Sandheim were really bad. They were all they all weren't that great. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to uh next topic, which we have the Flyers made a minor signing, which was funny because it popped up in the middle of all these trade rumors. Um, but uh Belpedio uh is back. Uh, for those who are not aware, he played for the Phantoms last year. He was one of their top defenders. Um, he uh, got a two-year deal, a slight bump, and I think it was a good signing. He's a guy who I think he's going to be 27. I might have to look it up. He is 27 now. 27 years old, right? Yep. Yeah, so he's not going to be more than that. He probably won't touch the NHL next year. But as far as being part of this young core um, with Grons on the right side, maybe Adderd, uh, maybe Yenning will play the right side. Who knows next year? Um, but I think it's a good signing. Um, any thoughts about Belpedio? I, I think it's good that they rewarded a guy. Uh, I think for Belpedio, it's just kind of run run of the mill uh, type, you know, veteran defensive signing. He played really well last season. Phantoms go to the playoffs, so why mess with uh, a player who had you know success there? He's one and of the best it, players too. Yeah, exactly. And it, it seems like Laperriere used him in a lot of different situations down there, so it, it makes sense. He's probably one of um, Lappy's guys that he, he likely wanted to bring back, right? So it's not too much of a surprise. What do you think, Connor? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I think you pretty much just. Hit the nail on the head right there. I think maybe, maybe he. I don't know who he was playing with down there, but I know Adderd was an AHL All Star. Maybe if they were a pair and they want to keep Adderd's they're, development going, they're both right side. So Adderd. Okay. Uh, at, so I think he was playing with Zamula primarily until Zamula got hurt, and then I do think he played a little bit with Andre as well. Yeah, I think Andre only played ten games. So yeah, right, and he looked good in those ten games. I think he had six points in those ten. So maybe they want to keep that pair together until uh, until Andre's ready to come up. Uh, Torst seems to love Zamula. He's someone who I'd probably expect to make the opening night roster just by default because of because Danny Breer's trading the whole blue line. Um, 
But yeah, I think this more or less comes down to a depth move. Uh, someone that you want the young guys to keep playing with. Consistency is good. So, I mean, like you said, Yuri, he's only got four total NHL games, so he's not going to be up with the big club unless something goes really, really wrong. Um, but yeah, I think this probably just to keep the partners the same, um, maybe help Andre grow a little bit, have him take more risks. I think he's more of a offensively inclined defenseman, which – should go great up here, but yeah, I think that's a good point. Let's let's use this to transition into the topic. And you brought this up to me before, Connor. So, you know, you mentioned a little bit about Mula getting a call up, um, and now every defenseman under the sun is being moved out. We don't know exactly who's going to be in here, and I do caveat with this um, that I do suspect the Flyers to be somewhat active in free agency. I don't expect a big name to come over unless they're old. Um, but I do expect them to add, I'll, I'll say, I'll caveat this, and then I want to open up to you, Connor. I don't see the defense that we have on paper today being the defense that we ice next year. I think it's almost 0% chance. Even with Sanheim moving makes that even more impossible. So I expect more changes, uh, or at least a very young defense, um, but definitely not the NHL names we see. So what do you, Connor, what are your thoughts for... Um, you know, if you had to look at the roster today, what, how are you looking at this defense? I think, obviously, if you have Sanheim, he's going to be on the top pair. I don't think they'll have Sanheim. Um, so, as of right now, I think York is probably the top guy on the left side. Uh, I would assume that he's going to play with Sean Walker. Um, maybe similar kind of play styles. I don't know much about Walker, uh, but I think he might be more of a two-way guy. I know York's definitely more of an offensive guy, but he's primarily played on the right side, so it'll be nice to get him on the left side, see how he looks on his natural side there. Um, I think Zamula will probably crack. If he's healthy, he'll probably crack the opening night roster. He did it last year. Uh, he got 14 games in, in Philly this year. Uh, ended up with four assists, so I think he could definitely see a lot more time uh, up at the big club. I do hope he's healthy. Um, because if he is, I could see him maybe playing next to Rista Linen a little bit. That'd be a pretty, pretty big pair, uh, pretty grinded out kind of kind of pair. Uh, as a nice second pair there, Rista Linen has been pretty steady in that second pair. Usually, it's been with Sandheim, uh, but obviously now we know that Sandheim's probably not gonna be here. Uh, and then on the bottom or on the third pair there, you have Sealer who can play both sides. Um, I don't really understand all the trade market around Sealer. I mean, he's definitely a great guy in the in the room there, but and he does have a good contract. Like he's only signed for seven hundred seventy five k this year. Um, but I mean, after that, he's just kind of a steady defensive defenseman. Um, doesn't play a ton, kills penalties, um, but that's really about it. Maybe. 16 ish minutes a night. I'm not really sure. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, something, something like that. 15 yeah. minutes a night. And then just after that, your seventh guy, I'm hoping that it can be uh, Emil Andrea. Maybe not out of camp, but uh, if you do want to look to that free agent class, uh, like you were talking about earlier, I think Eric Johnson would be a great guy to bring in here. Uh, older oh. guy. Yeah, you can have him on a one year deal if he plays really well, then you can flip him. Um, but even if not, he's, he'd still be a great guy to have around. Do you hear all the all the Avalanche players talking about how big an influence he was for them? Uh, he was there, I think he was the first pick in was it, 06 or 07? Yeah, he's the first overall pick one of those years. Yeah, yeah. so he's he's been there through – he played with Briere, actually. Uh, he's been there through – uh, all the bad times, and he saw them kind of rise all the way up. I think Landeskog actually gave him the cup first uh, after he was done with it. So that just kind of goes to show how big an impact he had on those guys. And really, with this uh, decor, with everyone being honestly close to my age, except for Walker, Ristolainen, and Sealer, um, I think he'd be a really good influence for a full year. Just you're going to give him a one-year deal. You can pay him however much he thinks he's worth. If you if you flip him, uh, then you eat half that salary. 
not not really a big deal. Um, and yeah, I just I think he'd be a really good get for for the young guys. Yeah, I think for for the defense, it all depends how it unfolds with the guys that are currently on uh, the defensive roster, right? Like if if Sandheim stays, I don't think they sign anybody. Um, but if they move on from Sandheim and they move on from D'Angelo, and both those guys are gone, um, then you're looking at a veteran for sure. Um, just to mention, I mean, there is a rumor out there that D'Angelo is going to be traded to um, the Hurricanes for like a an AHL type prospect, somebody with not a lot of pedigree. I believe the hold up there, and and this uh, is something I grabbed out of Bill Meltzer's article uh, that he he put up today. Uh, was it was essentially that it's a cap circumvention according to the NHL because it has not been a year yet since uh, the D'Angelo and Flyers trade has gone down. Uh, so that makes sense. Like I would expect that to get done. So if, if those guys move right, D'Angelo and Sanheim, I think you guys make a great point that that's a very young defense. You're going to have to add somebody. Really, your only veteran is is Ristolainen and Sealer. And Sealer has hasn't been an everyday NHL defenseman until he's really joined the Flyers organization. Like he played a handful of games with the Wild, but he's been an AHL, right? So you're going to want um, some more veteran presence back there to help your young guys through a rebuild. Because if you have your young guys like a York, like an Adder, like a Zamula out there on an island alone, right? It could be tough sledding for, for a young defenseman in the NHL. Um, looking at the UFA market, I think some guys that might interest them is like Oliver Reckman Larson. I know we've talked about him, um, you know, offline before here, Yareev. Um, Eric Johnson's a great option that you mentioned as well, uh, Connor. I mean, cup winner and has shown that he can have success with some younger defensemen in the past. I think some other ones maybe to, to keep an eye on too. Um, I don't know if he's going to make it to UFA, but Ian Cole, uh, Ryan Graves, uh, potentially, and, and somebody that we're familiar with that maybe could come back, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, is Radko Gudis. I don't know um, you know, if Florida will let him go because they have some injuries on defense if, if they end up resigning him, but I always liked Gudis. I thought he was a good um, you know, either second pair, if you need to play him there, or, or third pair type guy, and he brings a lot of veteran presence and is tough as nails, so if, if you're playing a very young defensive core, you want to have some guys that um, can protect them, and I think if you oh, had a wrist line in yeah, Ristolainen and Gudis, I think, would, would do that. So, I don't know. I, I think there's options, but I do definitely think that there's one defensive ad in UFA for sure coming up. I'm not exactly sure who, but there's some options for them. Yeah, and and I mentioned this before, and Connor, not to shoot down your idea, but apparently, like, Sean Walker's 5'11". Uh, York is 5'11". It's just, it's a pretty small pairing. Even what you said, the, the big pairing, I think maybe... Maybe you mix up maybe Risto with York. I I yeah. don't know. I have no. York idea. and Risto played a little last season together. So yeah. I I don't know. Um, I love the idea of an Eric Johnson, a guy who I want him on a one year deal if he's willing to do that. We'll trade him at the trade deadline. You know what yeah, I mean? Go to a like, contender. Exactly. Like literally, I would tell him that. I'd be like, I'll trade you at the trade deadline, but I want some of your presence around some of these young guys because that's what I really think we need. We need size, which Johnson has. Um, we're a small D. Like we're small. That's why I wanted Colton Pareko. Colton Pareko solves so much. And I would trade Scott Lawton for the Colton Pareko trade because I'm like, all right, well, I'm getting your assistant captain, a leader on your team, and a guy who can – I if if I'm Jones, like I would look for that in some of these returns. I try to do it without the UFA market, somebody who has – so maybe that's what they were thinking about Tory Krug. Maybe he's better defensively than I realize. I'm sure he's better than TDA defensively, but – we really need a veteran who can sit at the top of this lineup yeah. like a Matt Niskin, and we still need one of those to help create some. Maybe Risto can be that guy. I don't know. Maybe Sean Walker can be that guy. Um, I don't know how good Walker is. Though. My guess is he's just a, a pretty good bottom-pairing defender right? on a good team. On our team, maybe he's top four, right? But um, I don't know. I look at the setup of our D, and it just it looks so incomplete to me. Yeah. Um. Even without trading Sanheim, it still looks incomplete to me. I just expect a bunch of changes. Um, but who knows? Too like the I Flyers. No the Flyers jury could potentially want to ice a, a shit defense on purpose next season, right? <laughs> like that could be their plan. So it's not great for young guys' development. But if they want to finish, you know, well, to uh, that, with a top five pick in twenty twenty four, maybe. I mean, what if the Flyers? Like, this is the one thing we don't talk about at all because the idea of it is so 
terrible that like we really don't want to think about it. But what if Sean Couturier is done? And what Could if, the A- case, what if yeah. Atkinson is done? Then all of these trades make even more sense because that means they know something we don't know. And they're like, hey, we, without Couturier, without number one center, I've said it over and over again, without number one center, you're like, this is why we'll talk about the draft. I, I think going for Ford is so much more important than a defenseman at this stage because we need something to drive play. <laughs> Like, and you cannot do that without top centers. You just, it's not going to happen. They yeah. drive the play. So, like, while you need to execute the, the puck out of your zone quickly, a lot of times those guys aren't the top defensemen. You know, that's just not like Jacob Slavin. He's not the best puck mover in the world. He's a great defensive defenseman, right? Like, those guys you don't need to find at the top of the draft. Jacob Slavin wasn't found at the top. I don't even know when he was drafted. I almost guarantee it. I actually, I heard a mistake. I heard Danny Briere make a mistake in one of his interviews where he was talking about the Blackhawks and he said, Oh, he's like, they had, he's like, they had Patrick Kane and they had, they, he talked about how they drafted their team and he's like, Oh, and they found, uh, they found what's his name? Duncan Seabrook Keith. and Keith in the first in the round. First but they round. actually did it. Yeah. They did not. They found them. I think Seabrook was a third round pick and Keith's I think second rounder. Yeah. Keith was a second, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's to how, your point, Slavin's a fourth rounder. So, yeah. Okay. That's my point is like, I'm not interested in desperately trying to find a number one defenseman at the top of the draft. It doesn't happen. Noah Hannafin hasn't turned into one. Uh, Provov hasn't turned into one. Wierenski hasn't turned into one. But he's the closest, right? Hannafin was number three in the draft or something, number yeah. four. Yeah, the draft. it's really just, in recent memory, Heiskanen and Makar. A- Eric Johnson good, so. was never a number one defenseman. He was taken first overall. I just don't want to go. The idea is you find the best player available, the most talented to drive play, and then the defense you build with smart players, right? And then hopefully one of them turns out to be a top defender. But typically you don't need to find them at the top of the draft. Like it's just there are not many he- headmans coming in the NHL. Yeah, right? McCarr is exactly. Yeah, they, there's not many of those guys. Heiskanen, there's like what they don't always work out to be Zach Bogosian, Lu- Luke Shen. I can keep finding more defensemen who projected to be top pairing guys and weren't. And you, 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 Levy, right? He was like six overall for Vancouver. Well, you, Levy, yeah, dude. It's another Forget one. his name, but yeah. Well, Ole Yulevi. I there we go. <laughs> he was a late riser defenseman. Oh, he had it all and barely even plays in the NHL. Lucas Spiza, who the Flyers drafted at 19. Actually, if you go back and look at the draft that Travis Sanheim was drafted, he's still a top 15 pick. People think he's like a disappointment. He's still a top 15. Uh, not pick. a bad defenseman. Yeah, no. he was. Picked that was with, D'Angelo's draft too, right? Yeah. Right. Who would you rather have, Sanheim or D'Angelo? Right? D'Angelo put up more points. Sanheim is a better defender. <laughs> so definitely Sanheim. And again, that was a, he was projected to go in the second round, I believe. Sanheim. Yeah. He wasn't projected to go in the first round. We we picked up. It was like a shocker that we took him so high. So again, I don't want. That's why we can get into this now. Let's just because we're coming towards this. Let's just get into the draft, right? So. I'm still stuck on this. Like, I want a forward. If Ryan Bacher is the best guy we have available, fine. But I don't see that scenario, and I don't see the Flyers doing that. Um, I see the Flyers going forward heavy. Um, we should make it clear, and this was on Daily Faceoff. I, you might have mentioned this earlier, but I don't remember if this was on camera or maybe this was you, Connor. I don't remember if it was before or after, but Daily Faceoff did kind of say that the Flyers – um, are going to be gunning for a top pick. Like if they go out and get another pick, which again they could do with what they currently have, but if they go out and they get another first round pick or other assets, that they will be trying to get Matt Faye Mitchkov. That's yeah, the- move to four or five or something along those lines. That might not be necessary, but it does. Though what I my takeaway is that they hear the Flyers are being aggressive, and that's what I love. And I wouldn't even stop at four. I would try to be getting Fantilli. Like if I was. If I was Briere, I would be going big. Like, if I get my number one center, that's a huge weight off my shoulder. There's no guarantee that late first-round picks are going to be top guys in the league. Like, if I can guarantee myself getting a guy who's going to be a top player. So I'm still there. Um, and then I did hear this, and just to add this, is uh, that St. Louis, and that's why we're kind of wrapped up in this trade, is that they are not expected to be picking all three of their first round picks and people really expect them just to pick a 10 and then move on from the other two picks. So look for the flyers to maybe grab one of those. Um, and I think that'll potentially change what we do at 25, 22. Um, but I don't think it's going to change with number seven. 
Um, so what do you guys think? And I'll go to you, Connor, because Vasily's on this show every week. Um, what are you feeling as the number seven pick? Like, we'll go through players individually, but who's your guy? Like, like are you a Matt Fay Mitchkov? If he drops, that's our guy. A hundred percent. If Mitchkov drops, you have to take him. Like you were just talking about, the best player on the board, probably the best Russian prospect since maybe Malkin or Ovechkin, one of those two. Yep. I mean, you you see his numbers in the KHL. He's almost They're better. Point seven points per game. Yeah, he's. They're better than all of them. Kucherov, Panarin. He's, he's insane, OB, the kid, Malkin. man. Yeah, he's seventeen years old. Weighs a buck fifty, and he's just dangling around these guys bar down every time. So shot is. Really yeah, if he drops to you, then. I would be, I if I was the GM, I would sprint the card up to the table before anyone even calls me about the pick. Yeah, that's if you get him at seven, then I mean, in my opinion, whatever you do the rest of the first round, like you already got. If this is a Canadian junior kid, put it this way: if it's a Canadian junior kid, NCAA, Sweden, Finland, he's going number two. Hundred percent, yeah. Just because of what's going on in Russia right now. And also in part because he just signed a new contract, which I'll get into later, but it shouldn't defer the Flyers from picking him at all. Just because of what's going on in Russia is why he's going to inevitably fall. Because Bedard's a dunk, a slam dunk at one. Fantilli's going second. Yarmo was on a podcast or something today and said he was going to take a franchise center at three. The only other team before the Flyers that I could see taking him would be Montreal because I th- I'm i like 99% sure that San Jose is going to take Will Smith and that's fine. He's a great player. Should they take him over Meechkov? Absolutely not in my opinion. Whatever. What do I know? Um, But I think Montreal starting to fall in love with this. Let's get a third Kachuk brother in the Atlantic division and that's why they're going to take Ryan Leonard. Uh, Sort of like Goche last year where he just keeps catching helium and he keeps rising above. Um, if Montreal takes Mitch Cobb at five. Didn't they want Gautier last year? Montreal. They Did might have. Up? Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, well, they picked first, so. Yeah, both, um, they went for slap, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, right. No, they went with, uh, yeah, who's a very similar player, power forward, left winger, right? Yeah. Ritty. Um, so, yeah, I, like even if Montreal does take Mitch Cobb fifth, I think the Coyotes are pretty much locked in on the on Reinbacher, the right shot defenseman from Switzerland. Then the Flyers have a play driving center like Ryan Leonard, who's a little undersized, but he still has the motor, the skill, um, plays bigger than he is. So at seven, there's a bunch. There's so many different options they can do. They can go. Uh, Dvorsky would still be there. Zach Benson will probably still be there, who seems like he's dropping a little bit. Um, but, yeah, if Mishkov's there, you have to take him. Like, okay, he's not coming over for at least three years, but where is this team realistically going to be in three years? Are they going to be that one piece away, or are they still going to be mm-hmm. kind of – they should be done stripping it down by then. At that yeah. point, the young talent should be coming together – uh, the Farby, Frost, York, like that group, Tippett, that group will be a little bit older. You're hopefully starting to see some of them really pop, uh, like Frost did a little bit in the in the second half of the year. So, yeah, and then I think if you just drop a Michkov in there, then that really just opens up a window. That's Acceler- when you start getting aggressive. Things. Right. Yeah, that's when you start getting aggressive and you start adding people like how the Devils did with Timo Meyer at the deadline uh, this year. I think, yeah, I think it just opens up so much more you can do with the roster because he'll be on an entry level deal until he's twenty four. So that's that's where I stand on Mijkov. If he drops, you have to take him. Good. Yeah, that's that's my philosophy as well. I've said it for like probably the last like five weeks. Yeah. <laughs> if Meech Cobb drops, you have to take him. Like the kid's insane. Um, personally, I mean, before this draft, people were saying Meech Cobb, uh or Bedard Meechkov one two lock. People were even saying that Meechkov is just as talented as Bedard. And like I still say to this day, I'm kind of pissed that 
you know, Russia couldn't go to the World Juniors because I think if you would have saw them face off against each other, you would have really seen how close they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would have made things a lot more interesting. But, uh, I mean, who knows, like, what's going to happen at the draft? I, I do think the Russia and all the geopolitical things happening will probably cause Michkov to drop. But one thing I want to mention, um, and this is something that Jeff Merrick said on the 32 Thoughts podcast, uh, he said somebody texted him and said that they think the Ducks will take Michkov at two. This is not a report. They're just talking, freestyling. And then Friedman added that Pat Verbeek's the kind of person who would do that. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't really give a shit what anybody else thinks. So, I mean, who knows? He's the most talented. Like, let's, in my opinion, I think you guys all agree with me. He's number two in talent level in this draft. Um, so, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes high. His, uh, his but, numbers for his league are equally as... To, uh, as impressive as Bedard's for his. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and I, I think for Michkov, obviously through the Flyers and he drops you at seven, it's a no-brainer. And I think Briere and his kind of press availability with the best player available and all that type of stuff is kind of hinting at, hey, this is who we want. And and I think a lot of rumblings are going around. Like you mentioned that Sarah Valley uh, daily face-off um, kind of video where he talks about the Flyers would move up to take Michkov. Um, we'll see, I think. Um, the Flyers moving up, and, and if that happens, then you know other teams are hot after Michkov as well. Like, I know the Caps are rumored to, to to really want him. So we'll see how it all unfolds. I mean, if Michkov isn't there, um, right now, I was leaning towards um, Dalibor Dvorsky just because the Flyers, you know, need centers and things al along those lines, um, just because look at their center depth. But um, Zach Benson, man, like... I, I've watched ignore. yeah I've watched some more video on him um I've done some more studying up on Benson and he's got such he, good hands yeah he's got really, really good hands really good playmaker he looks um you know like the skating thing I watch video and I think it's just a little bit overblown that he's not a great skater like because from the video that I've seen of him whenever there's a puck race or whenever he needs to get somewhere to finish off the play or be in a position to make the play, he's always there anyway. Yeah, so. I, I'll define what they said about his skating. It's not that he's not a great skater. is that he doesn't have the breakaway. Yeah, the acceleration. Yeah, yeah, like he can't break and separate himself from players the way like, I mean, Oliver Moore is not a great example because he's like the fastest player since Big David. But um, we, yeah, it makes sense. He's uh, not blowing past the D. I think that's something you could work on, though, and with his IQ 100%. and and playmaking, and the fact that he's only like around 150 pounds, he's obviously not the size that he's going to be when he's going to be an impact player for you, right? So he's going to add weight, he's going to add some size. That's something they can work on if they select him. I saw this stat, and it kind of jumped out uh, at uh, like off the page at me when I saw it, and I'm kind of like, hey, like if Mitchkov's gone. I think Benson's it for me, guys. And reason being, I mean, listen to this. So Zach Benson has more U18 points in the WHL um, than Matthew Savoy, Dylan Cozens, Braden Point, Evander Kane, Braden Shen, Sam Reinhardt, Jordan Eberle, Matthew Barzal, Connor Geeky, Peyton Krebs. In the last five years, only Connor Bedard has more U18 points than Zach Benson. That sounds good to me, right? And he's, and he's good high list. end defensively, yeah. too. Yeah, um, so I think... Maybe, I mean, that, that'll that be their target, but we'll see how it goes. Like, who knows if Benson really drops, right? Like, and you're the Flyers and you pick up uh, 25 and 22 and you can't get Michkov because he's off the board early. Like, let's say he really drops and you know that teams aren't going to take him in 8, 9, 10. Like, would you try to trade up? Get somebody at 7 and trade up even, you know, more to try to get him, let's say, at 10 or 11? It's all it's all possible. Um yeah, I, I to add to the Benson thing, like he is hard to ignore, and yeah. I I don't even understand why he's dropping because his size isn't even that I think bad. It's the size, to be honest, for some but reason, but it's like, but skating. it's not that bad. No, it isn't. You know what I mean? So I don't his know. He's IQ, like just under five ten. IQ's off the charts too, man. Yeah, he, he like he's not that small. Like he's not. Uh, it's kind of like Travis Connect. It reminds me of Travis Connect. He was rated eleven, dropped all the way to 